All right, I'm Dave Ratt, and this is the third video in a series I'm doing on um, XLR mic cables, um, soldering them, uh, the different types of cable, different types of um, wire, flaws, issues. Today, I'm going to look at um, poorly terminated cables and talk about um, various issues and what to do right and wrong and different um, shrink wrap strategies to um, uh, alter the longevity or, and what works and why we would do it. So let's get started. I've got a pile here of um, various and some of them, I just, I went through a pile of cables and looked at the ends, uh, just old junk cables that we had sitting around the shop and um, uh, found various ones. And then I made up a few too, just to kind of demonstrate all the different faults and stuff. Okay, so let's start with moving the soldering iron away from my arm so I don't um, get a hot spot. Okay, so this one here, um, uh, let's take a look and we'll analyze the good and the bad. Um, see this distance here between the solder cup? This, first of all, it's soldered well. We're seeing the solder is filling the cup. It's covering the wire. It's protruding a little bit. It's not filled in the cup, but that's okay. It's a good, strong joint. And um, here we're seeing a distance between the wire, um, the, um, the cup, the solder cup in the connector, and the shielding on the individual wire. Uh, ideally, we want to have that be minimal. I mean, maybe one or two widths of the screwdriver end at best. This white one is better. Um, that's pretty good. We just don't want a lot of length there. And the reason is that it tends to be a weak point. And we want it to... Um, and also, it's just... It's just uh, yeah, ideally the insulation would be right up against the cup. Second of all, I'm flexing this and I'm seeing that this the solder has actually gone up into the under the insulation and I can feel that it's rigid that's good we don't want the solder just to be there and then like some copper wire or some uh, flexible wire showing so that way we've got the rigidity of the cup and the solder the solder going up into the insulator and then the insulator taking over which kind of spreads the stress out and it creates more strength um, this tinned wire that's soaked in solder is going to be pretty rigid coming out and then it'll slowly work its way to more flexible. That's ideal. Um, same thing here. This white one doesn't have solder going up as far. Um, I would probably have a little more heat to that, but that's okay. But the big problem with this is the ground um, serve shielding has got hairs hanging out. There's, there's extra wires that are just floating around here. And that's terrible because one of those could break off. Um, they're actually long enough to wiggle around. And even though they might not be touching now, um, it wouldn't take much to have them short out. It's just bad form. So we really want to have all the wires captured. You don't want to have extra bits. Um, so that would be a fail for me. Um, that would be a chop in place. Let's take a look at another one. Uh, this one here, um, <clears throat> I actually made this one just to demonstrate. Got a little excited on the strippage and um, look how long that is stripped there. And so when you're tightening up the strain relief, um, it wouldn't be that hard to get this thing twisted in there and then that's a, that's a fail, that, that's gonna short out. We really don't wanna have um, this long bits of wire that let's see what the other side of this looks like okay here we've got the ground wires looking pretty good i think i don't i see a hair i see one i call them hairs with the extra wire i see some wires that are not fully bonded not as neat as it could be but not the end of the world um we've got a short black wire and a long white and um um uh, ground shield wire, which means that if this gets pulled, all the stress gets put on one wire and not evenly dispersed amongst the three. We really want these all to be the same length um, so that the stress is um, distributed equally on, on all the wires. And if it was to get pulled, this black wire inside is pulling 
inside and it's going to it's going to be short so actually if we were to pull on both ends of this that black wire would take the copper down the middle of the black wire would take all the stress that's not a good um, plan and even the strain relief is not going to stop that copper from sliding inside the shield there okay let's grab another one um, here's a quad this is a canary quad where we've got the double red double white and the, or double clear and double blue and then the ground wire and what I don't like about this one is it's just a knot. It's just knotted up in there. Um, as we can see here from the pinch marks of the strain relief, that there was, they actually had, whoever made this had another quarter inch of, a little less than a quarter inch, three sixteenths of an inch of jacket they could have removed here um, and still used the strain relief in the same spot and had they so they could have run this there was no reason to knot this up so what they did was they they stripped it they cut the ground wire short they soldered the long ones in and then they pulled it up and so this kind of has the same problem one short wire excess stress on the ground and it just looks messy we can't really see additionally we're seeing um, um, uh, shrink wrap over the the connectors and i have no problem with shrink wrap if you need it to do it and it's it can be a good thing on the other hand we can't really see under the shrink wrap and if something fails we're going to have to cut that shrink wrap off in order to fix it um i personally don't use shrink wrap unless the cable is really going to be on the individual lines um for most cables it's going to last for quite a good time unless you're going to have a lot of exposure to moisture or uh, corrosion or you really just want to make a cable that's going to last an incredibly long time then using that shrink wrap and we'll get into shrink wrap more later um this one here what's okay i see what's going on with this this one was someone got a little excited with the solder here we can see that this has got quite the solder blob um, enough solder for maybe making another six mic cables on there. I'm seeing some spare stray hairs on the ground wire. None of them checking them to retention. They seem to be okay. Yeah, it's a little messy. This has got a blob here. None of it looks like it's touching another wire, so it should function. Oh, and then here we're seeing the red wire is actually not in the cup. It's sitting on top of the cup. Again, this will function. It's just not pretty. Additionally, this solder blob is right near the chassis ground. Now that fourth connection on, a, on, a, um, on an XLR connector is a chassis ground. And the chassis ground connects inside of most gear. The shield will be connected to the chassis ground or connected to a resistor and a capacitor or somehow related to the chassis ground, but maybe not directly connected to the chassis ground or the AC of the wall voltage coming in will connect to the ch chassis ground. And the shield, the audio ground, may have uh, some resistive lift to it. It may not be 100% bonded to the chassis ground. Now, most of the time, connecting to the chassis ground will be not, well, is not a problem. But there are situations where that could be an issue. Uh, we'll get on to another one because I know there's one in there that's got that bonded. And here it is. Okay, so this connector is made with the ground wire has been divided into two, and one of them is going to pin one, and the other one is going to the chassis ground, and then we've got our other two. That's an optional thing to do, and some people do it, some don't. The question is, why would we do it? Why would we spend the extra time doing it? And what are the advantages? Well, actually, the advantages are typically outweighed by the disadvantages. Most gear will have the chassis ground tied to the audio ground appropriately. To add an additional tie will create a ground loop or an additional connection or bonding between the two. And there's no real good reason in most cases to do so. Most microphones, all microphones, the housing will be bonded to the chassis ground. Tin one will go to the chassis. So there's no reason to do it again. It's already done inside the mic. Um, I have run into situations where the 
mic cable bonding the chassis ground to pin one has created buzz problems that were very difficult, very difficult to troubleshoot and finally figured out what they were. And went upon cutting that, it solved the problem. If the gear that you're tying into has a pin one lift on it, which is not uncommon on analog gear, if it, the XLR connector has a bond between the fourth pin, the chassis ground and pin one, that pin one won't work. It won't the chassis ground will be bonded to pin one. So you'll bypass the ability for the gear to lift pin one. Okay, so that's chassis grounds. Let's move on to, um, here's another one. This one's got shrink wrap over the ground wire. Now there's really nothing wrong with that. With those wires, with the little hairs, little fraying, having this exposed wire covered is actually not a bad idea and it's not unwise to do so. So when possible, this is actually like a rubber, um, this isn't even shrink wrap, this is like a, a, a rubber covering. Um, but yeah, covering that is, is a cool way to prevent that from fraying. It's not necessary on a well-made cable, but it's, um, it can be uh, useful. This one, the glue is put in pretty well. These two are too long and the, the um, insulator on the red is too far back and it isn't soldered up into the thing. They didn't put the heat on long enough for the uh, solder to flow inside. So there's a weak point here and I can move this red one. I can see that over time that would probably be the failure point there. Okie dokie, let's um, take a look at this one here. They've shrunk over each individual connector and not the ground. They probably heated up the ground and probably shrunk before they could get it down there. Not uncommon to have that happen where you just can't get it down. You, mean, you meant to do it, but uh, the heat traveled up and shrunk it before you got there. Um, not a big deal and uh, that's actually another good thing to do. The downside of this is you can't see if it's failed. So if you don't, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. It's nice to have the extra shrink and stability there, but it's also nice to have all the ends, all the cups, solder cups exposed so you can take a look and see exactly the condition of that. So if you're checking mic cables, uh, you're taking a look or you're inspecting or you're repairing them, you can see where the fault is uh, without having to cut the shrink wrap. Well, if you cut the shrink wrap to see if there's a fault there, and you want the shrink wrap, now you got to unsolder it anyways to fix it and put the shrink wrap back, can't get the shrink wrap, shrink wrap back without unsoldering it. Um, so it's a catch 22. Okay. Um, this one here, here's a short red wire um, and frayed, that's yeah, a mess. Oh, and shrink wrap over the individuals. Um, what's this guy got? Here, what they've done is they've taken and so saturated the ground wire in solder all the way up to the joint. Now, I don't find that to be wise. I like it when I see that the ground wire is um, tinned and it travels up a part of the way as the same it would under the insulated um, pair. And then it goes to the bare wires. And the reason is by having it uh, soldered and tinned all the way up to the top, again, you've created a weak point. If I move this back and forth, all the stress is right there at the end of that solder at that uh, where it's been saturated. And um, that's going to be more likely a failure point. Whereas if it traveled halfway up, there would be some flexibility and the um, stresses would be spread over a larger um, area, larger length. And this is perfect with the insulator coming up to the solder cup. The solder cups look good. They're well filled. Um, other than that, it looks great. All right. And here, this one has been shrunk and soldered and so uh, shrunk again. So we've got shrink wrap going over the entire thing and over the individuals. This is really done to as much work as we possibly can do to make this happen. Now the good part about this is if I move this, I can see that the stress is kind of, it's here, it's moved around a bit. It's added a lot of strength to this. It's covered it well. It's gonna reduce its exposure to corrosion. Um, the downside is you can't see if it's been worked on. So, uh, or if there's something broken in there. Um, so if the cable fails, it's hard to repair. And, um, but it is a high quality cable. So you're gonna want, if you really wanna make a long lasting cable, you're not gonna have access to it um, and you're not gonna replace them every so often. You know, doing this is a good idea. 
Uh, but typically for most cables, it's not necessary and they will last many years, 10 years or more in fairly high usage situations um, without doing extra work. And finally, we'll do our last one. Um, okay, here we've got an Amphenol connector with a strain relief and we can look and see, you can see that this strain relief has one, two, three, and it basically zigzags the cable to grab it. So it pinches it and forms like a kind of an accordion out of it. But they've stripped it back so far. Let's pull these out. They've stripped it back so far that um, the strain relief is just barely grabbing on the end. And look at this, they've soldered this way up. There's a lot of length here. Um, the actual solder cups, a little too much size, pretty good, We're well soldered into the cups. Um, they've tinned the ground wire all the way up. We don't like that. And we've got the strain relief grabbing it all the way at the end, which means that this is only grabbing right there. So right now, it is really gonna put pressure. And I think we can see it. Let's pull it back and take a look. Um, yeah, we're seeing fraying of the ground wire right there at that joint due to the combination of soldering this all the way up and the strain relief um, not getting full contact there. Um, so they've overstripped. Um, cool. All right, so that's, oh, the other faults would be uh, miswire, pin one to three swaps, two to three swaps, uh, one, to, one to two swaps. Um, on Another miswire that doesn't show up in testers is putting pin one onto a different pin, like not using the shields to pin one on. Um, and if you do the same mistake on both sides, um, it won't show up as a test fault, but the cable will buzz. Um, all right, so kind of showed uh, manufacturing or, or assembly errors. Um, I will, this will wrap up number three of the series on XLR cables, and I will do another one. Number four, we'll cover some more stuff. Awesome. So thank you for hanging out, and I hope you found this video and others that I do interesting and informative, and check out soundtools.com. Take a look at the products that I personally designed, some solutions for the pro audio industry, uh, analog over Cat5, a bunch of testers, um, and other useful tools. Um, Ratsound.com has got our sales department, rental department, install department. Uh, we sell a wide variety of pro audio and AV gear. We do installations, small to large, and we do rentals for Everything as small as local clubs and backyard parties all the way up to Coachella Festival and artists like Pearl Jam, Jack Johnson, Blink-182. And thanks for hanging out.